Um, so let me specify that before we begin this conversation, the innovation zone and the innovation district isn't a plan. It's not something that we have that we can check a bunch of boxes off and, and create. Initially, for the time being, it serves uh, primarily as a concept. Um, and it's one that if I just said, hey, we're going to create an innovation district or an innovation zone, and may have a lot of different interpretations. So I'd like to kind of prime the conversation with uh, a really short video that I think will give you a good sense of, of really what we're talking about. The geography of innovation is shifting. To find the innovative economy 20 years ago, a worker needed to drive to a secluded research park, work in isolation, and keep ideas secret. Today, proximity is everything. Workers want to be in urban places that are walkable, bikeable, hyper-caffeinated, where they can bump into other workers and share ideas. Firms also want to be close to other firms, research labs, and universities in collaborative spaces so that smart ideas can be turned into smart products for the market. Innovation districts are this century's productive geography. They are both competitive places and cool spaces, and they will transform your city and metropolis. So that short video is from uh, the Brookings Institution, and, and they do a great job of kind of priming the concept in terms of what we're talking about. It's not about apps and gadgets. It's about a new productive geography, the idea of creating a space where innovation can thrive. And my favorite kind of word in that, in that clip was hypercaffeinated. Um, I hope you guys are getting hypercaffeinated this morning. Um, so what are the values of an innovation zone or an innovation district? You'll hear me say those words. They're, they're kind of interchangeable in this conversation. Um, but really one of the core components, and Larry mentioned this, is the idea of that academic institution, that research anchor. And it is truly both a, a immense opportunity and, and frankly a, a great challenge in the sense that this med school is coming to Austin. Uh, there's really no other top tier research institution that's going to be developing something like the Dell Medical School. It is a, a once in a lifetime transformational opportunity, not only for the university, but for the city of Austin and frankly for this region. So, you know, what does that mean for Austin? What does that mean for that part of downtown? What does it mean for the state of innovation in our community? And what does it mean for the idea of an innovation zone? Um, really, it is the underpinning of an innovation district or an innovation zone, the ability to access that research and turn that research, world-class, high-end, cutting-edge research into companies, into products, into economic development for the city is really the crux of what an innovation zone is. Um, in other communities around the country, and we'll talk about those, it's not necessarily a university. It's usually either business-driven or through um, some sort of uh, research uh, institution that may not be academic. So that, that research component is critical, and taking that, those smart ideas from those people who are doing that research and turning into uh, economic development is really key. The idea of proximity, and the video showed that, it's not that you've got the, the university and 15 miles away you've got uh, a very you know, uh, cutting edge pharmaceutical company or, or biomedical company, and then in another part of town you've got a co-working space, in another part of town you've got a retail mall, in another part of town you've got a cool cultural district. The idea is you've got to blend it all together. The current state of, of creative talent that is emerging in our economy wants proximity. They're, they're starting families later, they're uh, avoiding driving, they're using mass transportation, uh, they want to be around other smart people, not necessarily in a cube or a cubicle, uh, in an office park somewhere in the suburbs. They want to be around culture, they want to be around vibrancy, and that vibrancy and that proximity not only allows them to thrive, but allows them to share their creativity and ideas with like-minded people in that space. And from that proximity, you get innovation and opportunity and even more creativity, and you get these very dynamic people bouncing around because they're hypercaffeinated, uh, hopefully into each other and coming up with ideas that individually they could not have come up with on their own. And the same goes for companies. Um, there was a story I heard about a innovation zone or innovation district in London where Ford, Ford Motor Company and Xbox, Microsoft Xbox came together and uh, shared information Microsoft about their, their joysticks for their games that have some sort of feature that, that rumbles whenever you're playing to give you some sort of mimicking feeling of what's going on on the screen. And Ford is going to inject that into their, their gear shifters to help teach people how to use standards. Pretty interesting concept. Seems weird that they came together and made it happen, but that's the value of uh, an innovation zone or an innovation district, the opportunity to have these people come together 
Um, one interesting kind of description of it I've heard um, in a presentation <clears throat> was that they're turning parking lots into cures for cancer. Taking spaces that are generally being underutilized and allowing smart people and smart ideas to come together for solutions, not only for economic benefit, but for social good. Um, a neighborhood to live, work, play, um, within walking distance of transportation, a sense of place. Um, downtown is incredible. Downtown has changed so much. Uh, but you'll see the part of downtown that we're talking about doesn't have that same sense of vibrancy. It's got a lot of great private landowners. It's got a lot of great activity in some aspects of it. And it's got a lot of great potential. And we'll talk about that potential here in a minute because it is truly immense. Um, and buildings providing views of academia and private industry, those two areas coming together and working uh, in shared spaces and, and sharing not only ideas but opportunities for economic development. And really a catalyst for job creation and, and economic development. And we can give you examples. Larry mentioned Kendall Square. There's also Interestingly enough, three and a half miles away in Boston, the South Boston Waterfront, which is another innovation district that's been developing, Mission Bay in San Francisco. There are examples not only across the country, and, but also across the world. And here are some of the ones we've been talking about. Uh, Boston, Cambridge, San Francisco, Atlanta, Detroit, interestingly enough, and we'll talk about them here in a second. Um, Philly, St. Louis, Seattle, Raleigh, Durham. Um, so this is not new, and Austin's not going to be on the front of it, which is always kind of a problem for us, but we're going to be the best. So let's talk about the different innovation districts and how they've developed. So what are you looking at right here is 22 at Barcelona. 22 at Barcelona was actually a government-driven innovation district in the sense that the government really focused on the development of this specific innovation district. Um, it was established by the, the, the mayor of Bar Boston, excuse me, Barcelona, uh, about 20 years ago, and, and I would say his name, but I would mispronounce it, so I'm going to skip that. Um, but it took decades of planning, it took millions of dollars worth of, of public investment to develop the infrastructure so that way the companies would come. Uh, and this is just one example of an international innovation district and one specific approach in terms of developing it. Um, and you know, in, in Europe uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, the, the underpinnings of things like public transportation and density are typically already there. It was really kind of crafting and creating uh, the, the infrastructure really surrounding, around, surrounding the, around the idea of public spaces and opportunities for creating these, these mixed use developments which were new to them that was kind of the, the linchpin for developing this sort of concept. Um, this one is in St. Louis. This is a Cortex, excuse me, Cortex Innovation Community. This is a consortium of uh, the universities in Saint, the St. Louis area who collectively came together and recognized that they had amongst them, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of I think, you know, 100 to 150 acres of, of brown space, uh, brown land that they could essentially redevelop. Uh, so they had a blank canvas and they recognized that their cap capacity to do research created an opportunity for them to bring in uh, industry, bring in uh, the entrepreneurial community, bring, bring in creative talent, and creative sense of place and essentially uh, vacant lots. Um, and what they've done is created this community that has served as not only an opportunity for them to share research with each, each other, but share them with you know, Fortune 100 companies like Boeing. Uh, the folks from Cambridge, the, the Kendall Square folks in the Cambridge Innovation Center, have actually set up a satellite spot in the Cortex Innovation community. So the idea of this innovation and this collaboration doesn't even have regional boundaries. It's, it's domestic and it's international. I mean, there's an opportunity for us to collaborate with different parts of the world. It's truly, truly uh, impressive. And then downtown Detroit. Everyone has vision, visions of what Detroit is now uh, or what they've heard of Detroit being now in terms of the news, the, the derelict buildings, the, the, the mass flight of the population, uh, the economic uh, you know, dismal current and, and potential future. But that's changing, and that's changing because of the business community. Uh, Dan Gilbert, the, the CEO of Quicken Loans, <clears throat> decided that he wanted to reinvest in Detroit. And what he did is he bought up a lot of real estate and a lot of buildings uh, in the center of Detroit, and along with private foundations, private philanthropy, other business owners, they've come together and said, hey, we want to revitalize this community. And the way that we're going to do that is through the idea of this innovation concept, this innovation district. We're going to create a space that will attract talent, that will bring business back to Detroit and revitalize it. Because when you bring that creative talent, you're also going to bring the culture. You're going to bring the retail. You're going to bring the residential. Uh, and they're actually helping fund some of the public infrastructure and public safety to make that part 
of Detroit not only economically viable, but, but residentially viable and commercially viable uh, in terms of retail activity. So a really interesting model and, and, and you know, it's, it's something that you can see amongst the three different examples that I've given, there are different approaches for every community. And I don't necessarily think that we uh, have any one specific approach that we can take in regard to these examples. I think we're gonna do things a little bit differently here. So changes in the air. The, the, the concept of, as, as the video mentioned, the, the secluded research parks the, the you know, lack of proximity, the lack of uh, you know, urban spaces um, that have been fostering and harboring <clears throat> this mentality of, of academic research and economic development and, and commercial viability is, is slowly disappearing. And, and I'll show you an example of how that's working out in communities that already have those sort of models where they're uh, a little bit more secluded. But you know, the idea of vibrancy, the idea of connectedness, the idea of creating really a, a mix where it's not just you know, uh, the academic institutions and the next set of buildings that are residential and another set of buildings that are cultural, another set of buildings um, that are retail. It's gotta be all in. Um, if you went to that model where things are secluded and, and compartmentalized, you really have an innovation district in name only or an innovation zone in name only and not one that actually creates the function that you want. Uh, we had a speaker come, uh, Tom Oshu, who actually helped me produce some of these slides, who said that the level of collaboration actually decreases by the floor, by the building, by the block, exponentially. So if, if the researchers and the commercial entrepreneurs are blocks away, the amount of collaboration diminishes exponentially, as opposed to if they were you know, in the same floor, in the same workspace, right next to each other. That's the type of stuff that we're looking for. The, the cost of doing business is, is changing, particularly for large Fortune 500 companies, particularly in the areas of, of things like biomedicine, biomedical, life sciences, pharmaceutical, prosthetics, things that potentially the Dell Medical School will help, to help us attract. Uh, and the notion of doing very costly research and development within those corporations is changing. Uh, and the idea that they can hypothetically outsource that to academic institutions, universities, uh, and be able to create partnerships with them is, is a new model that's developing and one that's taking a foothold in, in companies and institutions around the country. And I like this line here, it's the idea of transitioning from a lone wolf to a wolf pack. The idea that you know, being able to do those things on your own, for example, bringing a drug to market is so cost, costly and so cumbersome that it makes more sense to engage with other entities and create partnerships to have it, one, mitigate the risk and spread it out, but also create uh, investment and opportunities for other folks who can help you not only in that specific product, but other products in the future. So we're moving from formerly suburban to urban, uh, from automobile to pedestrian, from disintegrated to integrated, homogeneous to diverse, uh, inflexible to adaptable, and dull to inspiring. Doesn't that sound good? Like, don't you want all the stuff on the right and none of the stuff on the left? So what are the elements of the new model? What actually goes into an innovation zone or an innovation district? Research institutions, academic institutions. Here's the cool thing about UT. Um, well, here's the cool thing about Austin, everything. But here's the second cool thing about Austin. With the University of Texas, as well as the other academic institutions, not only in Austin, but in the surrounding area, you have, <clears throat> top tier researchers in, in medicine and engineering. You've got talented business people. You've got talented folks in, in social work and in nursing. And you've got the, the Pickle Research Campus. This community is ripe for opportunity. There are a lot of creative, dynamic, smart people here. And, and I'll give you an example of, of why we need to do something like this to ensure that those ideas, that, that sense of of inspiration and vision and, and brilliance can help translate into making Austin even more economically viable and a, a even stronger and more resilient community. Um, so governmental, private sector, land developers, venture capitalists, we need private investment to come into these companies, entrepreneurs, nonprofits, quasi-governmental entities. So here is the old model that we were talking about. So on the top left, you see uh, the Raleigh Durham Research Triangle Park. Um, it is everything that was on the left of the previous slide. Isolated, you know, lack of mass transportation. Um, it is 
It is cubes, and it is beige, and it is blocks. Like, there's no integration. There's no opportunity for, for me to be, you know, hyper-caffeinated and to go find someone and come up with something really interesting and dynamic that we couldn't do on our own. So on the bottom right is their strategic plan, their vision for the future of that space. You, in the bottom part, you see a rail line going through it. You see residential, you see green spaces, you see an evolution of the past looking forward to the future and identifying that the way they're doing business right now isn't going to work anymore. For them to compete with the likes of Boston and Kendall Square and San Francisco and Mission Bay and Austin and our innovation zone, they're going to need to change the way they do business and change the dynamic and really the infrastructure of their research economic development. And it's not the isolation, it's not, you know, parking yourself next to a highway and, you know, 30 miles outside of town and, and assuming people will come and work there and be happy and, and stay there and help you develop your products and your research to actually be successful. It's getting them there and having them be, the, be there essentially 16 hours a day, 24 hours a day, six, seven days a week. So we talked about Kendall Square and, and how many of you guys went on the, the, the trip to Boston and saw some of the stuff? A few of you, okay, good. So why, 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 why bother? I, I think that's a good question. Why, why is this important? Why does this make any sort of, of sense in terms of putting any effort, capital, resources, energy into, into this concept? Well, here's an example. So Kendall Square, uh, a partnership with, with MIT and the city of Cambridge to help essentially redevelop a, a, a former industrial part of Cambridge that, that served very little function and purpose at that point, and, and they created what, what most people see as a model innovation district. Um, so what does that mean in terms, of, in terms of actual benefit for the community? Um, so the Cambridge Innovation Center, which is kind of their, their entrepreneur startup community center, central focal point, um, founded in 1999. Um, the number of enterprises created, over 1,500. The number of jobs created, over 40,000. The number of dollars invested in companies in Kendall Square um, through the Cambridge Innovation Center, over $2 billion. And the number of companies who are continuing to preside in Kendall Square is around 600. Now, some of them are, are one and two person shops, but some of them are larger. Um, and this is the sort of economic development that we're talking about in a relatively short period of time. So let's look at their neighbors, um, the South Boston waterfront. So this was an initiative of Mayor Tom Menino, um, who was mayor for 20 years in Boston. Uh, and one of his last big kind of initiatives was the idea of creating uh, an innovation district in the South Boston waterfront. Originally, it was supposed to be, I believe, the stadium for the New England Patriots, and, and that moved. Um, so the mayor recognized that even though Cambridge was, you know, literally a few miles away, that, that Boston and, and the people of Boston and the talent that resides in Boston and the opportunity that resides in Boston, there was room for another innovation district and opportunity for another innovation district. And there were people who supported the idea and there was uh, that the talent, which, uh, you know, is something that we're going to harp on a lot, the idea of talent. Uh, and then the support both financially and, and publicly to engage in this idea. So this was started only a few years ago. Uh, and it's a beautiful facility, as you can tell. You know, it's got water and fancy buildings and trees, all stuff people like. Um, but their version of uh, the CIC, the Cambridge Innovation Center Mass Challenge, who's kind of one of their <coughs> excuse me, anchor tenants, who's helping facilitate that act, entrepreneurial activity in those startups. Um, and, in a matter of years, 361 startups accelerated almost 3,000 jobs created, and $362 million raised. I mean, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good return, and pretty good return in a very short period of time. So why? Why, why any of this? Why, why, you know, aside from all the stuff that I just told you, why Austin specifically? It's because of something like this molecule. So this is uh, texafrin. Um, I didn't know that's what molecules look like. This is evidently what molecule, molecules look like. I was told there'd be no math or science, but I apologize. Um, this molecule helps deal with, with cancer. It helps, I believe, uh, I don't know all the, the, the background of it, but it, it is a function to help deliver cancer medicine to cancer patients to aggressively uh, combat cancer, cancerous tumors. Uh, and it was created by Professor Jonathan Sessler here at UT. Um, and it was, you know, a very significant academic research finding. Um, and it happened here in Austin, which is great. But what happened next is the problem. So 
many people recognize that this specific molecule represented not only uh, an academic and, and medical breakthrough, but also an economic opportunity. So where did the investment come from? It didn't come from Austin, it didn't come from Texas, and it didn't funnel its way to Austin or to Texas. It made its way to California. It made its way to Silicon Valley, where Pharmacyclics, a, a company in, in, in San Jose, bought the rights, worked with Dr. Sessler to bring the molecule to market. And what happened as a result of that? They created 484 jobs. The, the market capitalization of this company is almost $7 billion. They're making $260 million in revenue and they're making $67 million in earnings. Now that would be nice if we were here in Austin. We should ensure that those things that happen here in Austin, you know, what happens at UT, what starts here changes the world, also changes our bottom line. <clears throat> So aside from that, aside from the talent and the opportunity and the research that's coming through, why Austin? Well, one, Prop 1 passed, and we're going to get this incredible gift and opportunity, uh, the Dell Medical School and the new teaching hospital. Um, it's an opportunity with a lot of other high-level development going on downtown, um, not only the medical school and the teaching hospital, but Waller Creek. Um, the Capitol Complex is going to go through some planning here in the near future. Um, and just the opportunities with those few things alone represent uh, a convergence that creates uh, a really unique and kind of special time for, for that part of the community and that part of the town. Um, a high concentration of local talent. Austin actually has the highest concentration of college graduates of any other major metropolitan city in the country. Um, and we have the culture to attract more talent. People love Austin. We're on the top 10 list of every top 10 list, including a list of top 10 lists. So <laughs> we're doing pretty well when it comes to top 10 lists. Um, we have a strong economy that remains vibrant, um, and we have a very dynamic startup and entrepreneurial community. How many people have heard of Capital Factory or Techstars or I think it's, yeah, quite a few. And, and those are just a couple examples of the, the folks out there who are helping accelerate and start up these really dynamic, uh, innovative uh, companies and products. So where is the zone? What does it look like? You know. We've gone through many iterations of, of naming this, this idea, this concept. Started as an innovation district, it's one to becoming an innovation corridor, then it was an innovation cluster, and then I let the mayor know that there are other connotations with the word cluster. Um, <laughs> and ultimately, we're a zone. Um, and the zone is, is I think, appropriate because, um, as Carrie mentioned to me before we started our breakfast, we want these people in the zone. We want them to be doing great things, to be on their game, and to be creating <clears throat> economic, cultural, and social uh, vibrancy and development here in Austin. But also, there are no hard and fast lines. Um, the idea of the Innovation Zone can extend oops, throughout the community. So this is you know, an overview of downtown. So to the bottom left, you have, if you don't know it yet, a high concentration of technology companies already, startups, entrepreneurial companies, things like Capital Factory, who already reside kind of up and down above the bars on 6th Street, all the way down to 6th and Lamar, kind of spread out throughout that area. To the, the east of I-35, you're developing and, and having seen a burgeoning creative arts community develop. Um, to the top, we have what would be a medical district or a medical complex with the university, the teaching hospital, and running right through the middle of it, and, and one of our speakers from one of our previous meetings called it, the, the spiritual center of, of this part of downtown, and probably this part of downtown, or the downtown as a whole, rather, Waller Creek. Um, so you have this convergence. And frankly, it's, it's pretty interesting what's going on in our community. And a lot of it's happening organically. We didn't touch it. It just kind of starts on its own. But you know, imagine if we put some strategy and some investment and some opportunity behind it, how we can flourish even further. So how do you make it work? How, what are the components that actually make this thing happen? Um, and we talked about the different ways people have been doing it. We've talked about folks who've been doing it through government initiatives, folks who've been doing it through private business, folks who've been doing it through universities. I think we'll do all of those things. I think it'll be a collective effort amongst a variety of entities who help make the innovation zone a reality and help make the innovation zone successful. So we talked about the three pieces, the physical environment, the innovation ecosystem, and the elements of community engagement. So we'll go through these relatively quickly, and I think they're going to send out the, the slideshow. A lot of this is too small to read anyway. Um, but really, the, the actual physical environment, the infrastructure, the buildings, the places, uh, the, the, the things like 
you know, laboratory spaces and co-working spaces and, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the really key drivers of making an innovation zone hum is that you need an anchor institution. You need one big successful company who can come there and help other companies work off of them and support them and, and participate as, you know, kind of the linchpin and the foundation as well as the academic institution. Uh, you have the innovation ecosystem. How do you actually support entrepreneurs? Uh, and it's not only through you know, things like spaces where they can work, but it's also mentorship. It's also financial capital. That's a big one. How do we take these companies and scale them up so that way they can be a part of uh, the, the, both the, the national but also global economy? Uh, and the last piece is the community engagement piece. Waller Creek is going to be a big part of that. Waller Creek represents you know, the spiritual center of the innovation zone and, and potentially a downtown, but also the idea of of making a, a vibrant place to live. You can't be hyper-caffeinated if there's no coffee shops. You can't get a sandwich. You know, you can't go see a live music show. It's gotta be inherently Austin. And, and we can look like Kendall Square, and we can look like Mission Bay, but we gotta feel like Austin. So what's missing? First one, transportation, getting people around. If we're talking about density, if we're talking about proximity, if we're talking about movability, mass transit is going to be critical to that. If you look at all the other successful innovation zones and districts around the country, one of the key components of its success is the ability to move large numbers of people through mass transit. And through the proposed rail line, there's the potential of doing that, going right through both the campus, the medical complex, and the innovation zone. Wet lab space. This has been one thing that's been identified to us. We didn't recognize it as needed at first. But the idea of, of people who are doing research to actually be able to conduct that research. To have the scientists go in there and do uh, the, the research necessary to come up with those breakthroughs, whether they're medical or, or otherwise. Uh, and what lab is just a fancy word for a lab with a sink and an eye wash, I think. So it's not you know, just giant pools of water that are hanging out. But pretty significant needs, 60,000 square feet. And then financial capital. So in current dollars, it takes 1.8 billion to make, uh, to bring a drug to market. Um, now, that's just one example of, of some of the things that might actually happen as a result of the Innovation District and, and certainly as a result of the, the research from the med school. Uh, but that's a lot of money. And even for, for a community as successful as Austin, that's a lot of money. We need to bring in dollars outside of our boundaries, outside of our borders, into Austin to help bring these companies to fruition, to help bring these products to market. And this is going to be a challenge, but I think it's one that, that we, can, we can meet. So here are the elements of a successful innovation district. There's geography, you got that. Mass transit, maybe we'll get it, hopefully we'll get it. Uh, entrepreneurs, got it. Developable space, hypothetically we're gonna get some of that. Financial capital, we've got a mix of that, not a lot, but we should hopefully get more. Knowledge capital, plenty of that through the roof. And then cultural arts, we, we have that in spades as well. But the one key component of all this is that talent trumps all. Talent comes first. If you don't have talent, it's not gonna happen. But if you have talent, money and resources and infrastructure will follow because people want to be around that talent. So our path forward, so what are we doing? So the mayor has engaged a group of stakeholders, the mayor's innovation zone advisory group. Um, our, our goals in the next few, few months through the rest of the mayor's term is to continue to engage stakeholders. Things that we're doing now, this group is meeting monthly. We're kind of going through and identifying all the various opportunities, plans, obstacles, um, things that we need to get accomplished, and the idea of creating this innovation zone, this innovation district. Um, looking at all the different master plans, as I mentioned, there's a lot of activity going on, a lot of different planning, uh, a lot of you know, significant entities in the community who are doing that planning. Can we find a way to get them to engage and all collectively pitch in and, and put some skin in the game to a bigger vision? Uh, and developing that vision is going to be critical. What does it look like? both physically and spiritually and culturally and inherently, that this needs to be not a, a, you know, a Kendall Square 2.0 or a Mission Bay Light. This needs to be Austin's innovation zone and it needs to feel and look and, and act like Austin. And then how do we actually make it work? You know, I, I, the idea is that we can put a lot of stuff down on paper in, in the city, sometimes we're, we, we do a lot of that. But the real key for this to be successful is the execution. How do we bring all these partners together and how do we actually make it work? How do we actually do it? Um, and whether that's creating some sort of entity that helps facilitate that or working on some sort of uh, you know, governance or execution strategy and structure, that's going to be critical. But the thing that, that I will say before I, I give up the mic is that we need everyone involved. Um, it's not just the mayor's office leading this. It's not just 
uh, the, the university. It's not just uh, you know, Central Health and Seton and the folks from Waller Creek and the folks from the state. It's the private landowners. It's the folks who, who operate the businesses uh, in that part of town. It's the folks who, who want to see it be successful. It's the folks who want to make investments there. It's the folks who are part of this entrepreneurial community. Like, it's a collective effort. And for us to make a collective impact, we all have to participate in this effort. So I'll just leave you with a few big questions. These are not the questions we necessarily want you to answer today. But these are things I want, I want you to think about. Um, so how do you support and catalyze innovation? I think innovation is this new, fuzzy, interesting word that means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And I you know Carrie will expand upon that. Um, but what does it mean for Austin? What does it mean for the, this opportunity? What does it mean to actually support and catalyze and create a platform for innovation? That seems so ambiguous. How do we clarify that? How do we look to build that opportunity. And it may not be apps and gadgets, it may be process and infrastructure and resources. So let's think about that. Um, how do we create and sustain a culture for that? Kind of going back to what I said, you know, inherently Austin, I think we have an incredible advantage that Austin is so great, Austin's so cool, Austin's so hip, Austin's so everything, that how do you ensure that you don't create something that's not Austin uh, and doesn't represent the values of this community? And I will add one more thing to that. There is a component of this that's also social innovation and social impact. Can we have these smart and talented people not only create economic development and products and companies, but can they create solutions for our community's issues? Can they take their talent and take their opportunities and take their resources and help us figure out solutions to educational inequity, to, to helping support workforce development, to helping create um, viability in not only that part of Austin, but all of Austin? What do we hope to gain from an innovation district? What are, what are our you know, values that can be espoused in the innovation district that will have direct benefits that we want and prescribe to? And hypothetically, there may be stuff that kind of happens that we don't expect, and how do we deal with that? Uh, and then what is success, and how do we quantify that? So with that, here's my contact information. Feel free to contact me if you'd like to discuss this any further. And, and I'll come back to the slide in just one second. I also want to thank. Uh, Tom Osha, who's from Wexford Science and Technology Consulting, who helped us put together some of the information that we use for today's presentation. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Carrie O'Connor. Uh, and Carrie will talk about her work and, and the concept of innovation. And, and Carrie's a very unique thinker. And typically, when I say that of someone, it's not always a compliment. But with Carrie, it completely is. Her brand of thinking and her way of approaching things is really, really dynamic. And I think you'll learn a lot. So with that, Carrie O'Connor. Um. I know you might need to get more hyper-caffeinated, so if you need to get up during my talk, that's totally fine. Um, I want to just sort of introduce myself to you. I've been on the job now for eight weeks, and I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to meet the folks who have nurtured this diverse, adaptable, connected, inspiring city that I now call home. So thanks for having me here today. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself, where I came from, and why innovation is important to me. And, and how I ended up to, to be here. Um, you know, at some point in your career, you look back and you try to connect the dots on how you got where, where you find yourself. And I look back and I said, well, let's think about this. In 1991, I graduated high school and I went to college, so now you all know my age, it's totally cool. And I was gonna major in international affairs. And that summer, as I was getting ready to start college, the Soviet Union started to collapse. And my teachers were like, oh yeah, the, the Cold War and the Soviet Union, we're not really sure how to teach you uh, about the world. I'm like, but I'm majoring in international affairs. How can you not know how to teach me about the world, right? Um, 1995, right, the World Wide Web starts to come into its own. And I watched my grad school and all of my subsequent organizations struggle to adapt to this new opportunity. In September 10th, 2001, I joined the US Foreign Service it was kind of a rough day on the second day. What does foreign policy mean? It's not what you thought it meant. How am I gonna do consular work when we gave visas to hijackers? And we had no framework for that. We didn't know, just like pilots didn't know, you know, that somebody was gonna to wanna to get on a plane and run it into a building. Um, then 2004 to 2006, I was working overseas. Social media starts to really take off. And I'm still wondering why we have carbon copy work order forms at the embassy. Um, 
much less how do we take advantage of social media. So again, I watch organizations struggle with how do we adapt to social media? What is Web 2.0? What is Government 2.0? What is Management 2.0? Um, and so finally, I had an opportunity to start an innovation capability at the State Department. It sort of landed in my lap. And what I recognized, finally, is that there is no script. There really isn't. Um, disruption is going to come whether in terms of opportunity or threat. We're hyper-connected, so it's going to pretty much impact us all. Um, and there really is no script for how you deal with it. So that brings me to why I care about ideas and why I care about innovation. There's a lot of buzz around it. For me, and there's different shapes and flavors and sizes of innovation everywhere, and this isn't the same for everyone, but it's important to know what it means to you. To me, innovation is any project that is new to you and it has an uncertain outcome. And those two components are really important for two reasons. If you have a certain outcome and you know what you're going to do, you have an execution project. You don't need me. You know exactly what you're going to do. It's just about figuring it out. Um, getting the right talent, getting the right money, but this is where you're headed. Um, when you have an innovation project, you're like, ooh, I'm not really sure how we can shape this possibility. It's, the start's a little fuzzy. It's a little bit ambiguous. We get really uncomfortable because who doesn't like, you know, we, we really prefer certainty to uncertainty. And so we will create that certainty. So part of innovation is allowing yourself to be uncomfortable at the start. To, to just roll around in that ambiguity, to let yourself not have a preconceived notion, but to rather find your way. Now, the new to you part, um, when I was at the State Department and I brought in um, an employee idea generation program, I had read a lot about IBM Innovation Jams. I was like, it's going to be exactly like that. <laughs> you can imagine IBM is a really large company. They have their own special secret sauce of algorithms. And no, it did not turn out exactly like that. And I learned the hard way that you cannot bring in somebody else's innovation into your organization or your city and expect it to succeed. Because even though it's been done before, it has not been done before with your talent, with your money, with your culture, with your resources in your situation. Nobody really is exactly like you. So you can't ignore the sort of you know, topography of your own situation when you're undertaking an innovation project. And that's what I love about Austin. Austin, like when I told people that I was coming here, everybody's eyes lit up. Everybody. The top 10 list of top 10 lists is exactly right. This town has a reputation that is different from any town on the planet. Right? Like, so when you build, when we build this innovation zone, it's going to be Austin's innovation zone. It's going to be according to how we see the world, how we've developed so far according to our history, our culture, our talent, our arts. And our challenge is just, you know, creating it like we would be sculpting, you know, this, this ambiguous lump of clay. We're, we're, we're building it. And you guys have already been doing this. Like, this is, in a way, it's not that new. You've been building it for a long time. This town is hot. It's amazing. The creative talent and energy, I just couldn't have landed in a better place. So one thing to, to think about, Sly talked a lot about dynamics. Um, he showed you a, a picture of a molecule, right? So what really fuels innovation? It's the ideas. I see ideas exactly like molecules. That molecule cannot live on its own. Your idea that comes out of your mouth, like it, it just comes out of your head, it comes onto paper, it can't live on its own. It needs, it needs everybody's help and support in order to evolve and to be connected to other things, right? The molecules that make up this, this lectern, you know, somebody needed to shape it. And with ideas, it's the, same, it's the same way. Stephen Johnson wrote a really great book, I don't know how many of you have read it, called um, Where Good Ideas Come From, The Natural History of Innovation. I highly recommend you read it. Not only is it entertaining read, really engaging, al along Malcolm Gladwell's writings, but he talks about the dynamics that exist in an environment where good ideas come from. Um, first of all, he talks about the adjacent possible. Um, ideas don't really happen outside of the box. Everybody likes to tell you, just think outside of the box. And I'm here to tell you that's a dumb idea. Adjacent possible is everything that exists right here, right now. And innovation happens along the edges. And if it's way too far outside of the box, it doesn't have enough to connect to. That molecule is just hanging out there without anything to give it life. 
um, which is possibly why that company had to move to California in order to bring its molecules into life. Um, instead of thinking about it as outside of the box, think about where the true edges of your box really are, because that's what I find. I find sometimes when we have that preconceived notion, we're just right here, but really, opportunity is right here. There's all this other stuff that exists. We've just got to find it. The second thing that Stephen Johnson says exists in an environment where good ideas come from is a liquid network. Right? Think about those molecules again. This lectern isn't changing into something else anytime soon. It's a solid. The molecules are pretty much set. Your research parks in your suburbs, you know, again, they're pretty much set. They're there. They're, it's not, there's not a very liquid network. If you have a gas, the molecules in a gas are too frenetic. They can't connect. Nothing's going to gel. Nothing's going to catalyze. But liquid is where things catalyze. Liquid is the choice uh, of chemists and, and scientists, right? We need the wet labs. So really what you're creating is a liquid network when you're creating the hyper-caffeinated, hyper-connected, you know, uh, city, because that's where ideas come from. That's why everybody's focused on these innovation zones and districts. Um, once you have those two things, you're looking for the adjacent possible and you've built this liquid network, then all kinds of other things happen. You got the serendipity. We sometimes learn from mistakes. We learn from other people's mistakes, um, like the story with the, with the joystick in, in Ford. I can adapt and exact somebody else's thing to my own context. Um, you talk about uh, this platform. And this is the thing that Steven Johnson says will catapult you beyond the adjacent possible, really outside of the box. It's building the platform that takes the adjacent possible to the next level. He talks about platforms like YouTube. In 1999, YouTube could not have existed. A lot of technological puzzles had to fall into place for somebody to go, oh, I have an idea. Why don't we create a video sharing site? And then off of that video sharing site, you've got all kinds of innovations happening, including cat videos, which I think psychologically are kind of an innovation. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how to monetize my cats. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so the platform is what catapults us to the next level. And this innovation zone concept is how we can build that platform that opens up new possibilities. We can't ignore the threat of disruption. It'll come at us. But if we've built this adaptable, diverse, connected, resilient community that can continually innovate, we'll be fine. We'll figure it out. We don't need a script. But it's really the opportunity that I'm worried about. And this is where I see my job, is helping open up opportunities and expand them and explore them, because that's what innovation is about. It's about creating the right environment where you can deal with that uncertain outcome and you can find the new adjacent possible that you didn't even know existed. So I'm really excited to work with you guys, really excited to be a part of this community, really excited to nurture this city to, to be even more than, than what it is right now. Um, in the next couple of weeks, I said I've been here eight weeks, my 90 days is up short soon. I'll have a, a business model, we'll figure out how we're going to build these partnerships and, uh, and where the effort is needed most. Um, but I look forward to working with you all in the meantime. So. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sly and Carrie. We really appreciate it. Appreciate you being here. We're going to get everybody out of here in probably the next five minutes, but don't leave just yet. Um, I think the microphone got a little shorter on I'm not sure. Um, so it is an exciting time in downtown, obviously. And um, we are grateful for, uh, to Mayor Leffingwell for his leadership in creating the uh, Innovation Working Group and helping to bring our community together and our leaders together to create a, a bolder vision for this important area in our urban core. And we at the Downtown Austin Alliance certainly appreciate his leadership. So as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we want to get your feedback today. And there were three questions. So on your tables, you could, should have little yellow sticky pads and markers. We want everyone, you're, you're not allowed to leave until you write down at least uh, answers to each of these three questions. So we'd like you to do that. Take a minute for us. Question number one, what competitive advantage does downtown Austin have over other cities? So again, what competitive advantage do we have over other cities? Number two, 
what can the uh, Downtown Austin Alliance contribute, or how can the Downtown Austin Alliance contribute to a lifestyle that is a draw for the talent employers are looking for? What are the things we need to do to attract the talent? And three, what are the challenges to creating a vibrant space in the innovation zone? What are the challenges to creating a vibrant space? So if you do us a favor, take a moment, write some responses to these questions, and then when you're done, you can stick them on the, uh, the, uh, the whiteboard over there. I think we have it, all three questions. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to compile the answers and we're going to share these with, uh, not only with Sly and Carrie, but also we're going to share the, uh, the answers and responses with the Mayor's Innovation Zone Working Group. So again, we want to thank you all for your time this morning. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you for your, uh, your energy and for your responses. So with that, we're going to conclude this once everybody's written their, their answers. All right, thank you very much for being here.